So hello, welcome again. My name is Simmons Bunton. I am the uh, editor-in-chief here at Terrain.org and the director of Terrain Publishing, our nonprofit parent organization. And um, I want to let you know that I'm here in Tucson, Arizona, where I respectfully acknowledge my presence on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Odom and the Pascuayaki, as well as the beautiful Saguaro and Creosote populated valleys and hills and arroyos nestled between the Santa Catalina, Rincon, Santa Rita, Tortolita, and Tucson Mountains. Welcome, thanks for joining us. I wanna thank host Derek Sheffield, who's joining us from Leavenworth, Washington, and may or may not be wearing pajama bottoms. I want to welcome our uh, readers and thank our readers, Chris Dombrowski, C. Marie Furman, and Julie Trimmingham. And I wanna thank you, our audience, for joining us. So thank you. If your connection becomes slow, you may want to turn off your video. In all cases, please remain muted, but you are welcome to post your questions and other positive feedback in chat. And I'm sure we'll open it up to audio questions during the Q&A that follows tonight's reading. We are recording this, as you know, in all readings and conversations, and we'll make those available from terrain.org and our YouTube channel a little bit later this week. We'd love it if you would officially follow our YouTube channel which is at youtube.com slash c slash terrain org. This is our final reading of the fall. We'll begin again in January, so keep an eye out for the dates, readers, and registration links, all of which will be available on terrain.org, as well as our Facebook page and announced via our e-newsletter, which if you don't already, you should subscribe to. And we welcome sponsors for all of our upcoming readings. If you're interested, please uh, drop a note to me in chat or send an email to info at terrain.org. Okay, a few announcements and other words about terrain.org, the world's first online journal of place, publishing since 1998 and celebrating now this month our 25th anniversary. Very exciting. We will shortly announce our Pushcart Prize and John Burroughs Nature Essay nominations. So check our website for that announcement probably tomorrow. Um, we open our general submission period for poetry, nonfiction, and fiction again on December 15th. You may submit beginning then via our submittable portal, which may be accessed at terrain.org slash submit. Again, that's December 15th for our general reading period, which was a little delayed this year to allow us to catch up because we have so many excellent contributions in the queue. We have some other exciting, sorry, admitting somebody. We have some other exciting announcements coming up too, which will be posted on terrain.org and social media, including the winners of our 13th annual contest in poetry, nonfiction, and fiction, which we expect to announce in mid-December-ish. Um, we have um, some announcements on new editors and editorial board members coming up. So be sure to like our Facebook, which is at facebook.com slash terrain org uh, to get the latest info, as well as, of course, checking out the website itself, which, by the way, is terrain.org. So finally, um, eh, maybe not finally, but I want to extend a big thanks to the many of you who participated in our inaugural online auction and fundraiser last month, which was a big hit, and helped us raise more than $14,500, which allows me to say that you are all the best. Thanks again. And I do want to remind you, however, that tomorrow is officially Giving Tuesday. So we would gladly accept any giving you want to send our way at terrain.org slash donate. And in case you're curious, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization through Terrain Publishing, terrain.org's parent organization. Okay, but enough about that. Let's now turn to tonight's, com uh, tonight's reading, followed by Q&A. I'll be posting terrain.org and book links in the chat in support of our readers this evening. Oop, let me let one person in. Uh, but if you missed those or want to find other books by tonight's readers and other terrain.org contributors, hop on over to our bookshop page at bookshop.org slash shop slash terrain.org or find the link under about in the terrain.org website navigation menu. Also, be sure to post your thoughts and questions in chat as we look forward to an engaging conversation following the reading. And finally, thanks again for joining us. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Derek Sheffield, 
who, as I mentioned earlier, may or may not be wearing pajama bottoms for the reading this evening. He's a man of distinguished plaid, that I will say. Uh, Derek Sheffield's collection, Not for Luck, was selected by Mark Doty for the Wheelbarrow Books Poetry Prize. His other books include Through the Second Skin and With Me and Elizabeth Dodd, Dear America, Letters of Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy. The collection he recently co-edited with Liz Bradfield and our reader this evening, C. Marie Furman, is Cascadia Field Guide, which we're really excited about the launch of, I think in March, yeah, Derek? And that has March. been dubbed, March, okay. That has been dubbed a field guide by Drew Lanham, a gift by Robin Wall Kimmerer, and a wonder by Ross Gay. Derek is the poetry editor of terrain.org and can often be found in the forests and rivers along the east slopes of the Cascade Range in Washington. Also, I'm going to put a link real quickly, if I can copy this properly. Not that I want you to go there right now, but I'm going to put a link here in the chat that you will want to visit after the reading this evening. This is a poem comprised by Derek, and you'll have to say, tell us who it's with, Derek, from the, <laughs> from the Rediscover the Cashmere Museum in Pioneer Village. Because if Derek needs another job as a voiceover <laughs> kind of person, well, he's pretty excellent there. So again, don't, don't interrupt the reading for that, but you'll want to go check that out. So, okay. So um, Derek, thank you for joining us to host what I know will be a wonderful reading with Chris Dombrowski, C. Marie Furman, and Julie Trimmingham. Please, my friend, take it away. Oh, thank you, Simmons Bunton, Editor-in-Chief of Terrain.org. Listen, I'm coming to you all from the land, the traditional land of the Pascuosa, and the Pascuosas, aka the Wenatchee tribe, are part of the Colville uh, tribes. And um, as it happens, one of my favorite artists is a Colville tribal member, Carly Federson. She is actually the um, native artist and poets that I co-wrote that poem advertisement uh, with for the Kashmir Museum, which was really fun and interesting. And we co-performed it uh, for that for that YouTube video. But um, Carly, uh, and here's what you wanna, here's what you need to know. Carly Federson is a beautiful poet who works not so much in words these days, but, um, it, her poems find their way into metals and gems. And here's a little poem for you right here. So when you get a chance, check out her work. This is pretty, what, just a, one of my favorite ever pieces. So Carly Federson, uh, Colville tribal member. Listen, I got to tell you, <clears throat> um, when I was reading Julie Trimmingham's story in terrain.org last week, uh, I, was I was reminded about why Janice Ray calls terrain.org the best place for environmental writing, period. Um, oh my gosh, uh, as I don't know if she's, I hope you're reading it tonight, maybe you are. Um, but if she isn't, you have to, well, either way, you got to go and track it down on the, on the site and read it because once you start into it, you can't stop. It's so interesting. Um, and I, I don't know, I really think that in a, in at least a couple of different ways, it sort of pushes the, uh, definition of, um, environmental read, uh, writing the, the, the feel of it in such an interesting way. I'd, was clear to me why it was one of our, uh, it was a finalist or a winner of our annual fiction award. Um, so uh, Julie is a mother, uh, a writer, activist, and she's living on traditional Lockdomish territory in Northwestern Washington state. Julie, um, we need to talk more after this because my daughter is coming your way next year to attend uh, college at Western. Um, so I need to put you in touch with Zoe. She's a poet too. Julie's previous work has, um, well, it includes the novella Mockingbird, uh, the fictional travelogue Way Elsewhere, and essays for 
Numero Sync Magazine. Julie Trimmingham, please take it away. Thank you so much, Derek, for that lovely introduction. And I want to thank Simmons and Terrain for creating this gathering tonight and also for creating a really wonderful sense of community. And it's a community that I'm a new part of and really delighted to be a part of. I was so thrilled when this story, you might think we're praying, was published in Terrain last year. And I feel so honored to be sharing time and space with Derek, C. Marie, and Chris, um, and I look forward to their words tonight as well. I also want to thank each and every one of you who have joined here tonight. Um, I know writers write for different reasons, and one of the reasons I write is to connect, to be in relationship. And so your engagement with this story is to me part of the story making process, and it's a real joy. So I, I appreciate um, you here tonight. As mentioned before, I am calling in from, and I make my home on traditional Lactamish territory on the Salish Sea in north of Seattle, just south of the, um, the Canadian border. And I am eternally grateful to the Lactamish people and other Coast Salish peoples for their leadership and guidance on how to be on this land in a good way and to be in loving reciprocal relationship with this place. So the story you might think we're praying is too long to read in its entirety tonight. So I hope this works, but I'm gonna tug on a couple of different threads in the story and read excerpts from those threads. And we're actually going to bypass um, some of the narr narrative action and focus on the character and some of the relationships that define him. Um, and part of that is so that if you read the story or have read the story, tonight will be a different experience and it won't be utterly redundant. And I know that uh, there's also a read aloud version of the story at terrain.org. And that was really fun to do. I love that terrain asks us to, um, if we want, do audio recordings of the stories. So I'll give a bit of context and I'll read a couple of excerpts and we'll, we'll see how it, um, how it goes. A lot of the characters that I work with, I, I like putting them on a moral knife's edge and seeing which way they fall and which way readers think they fall. And I always feel that I've done my job if some readers think that what the character does is good and some readers think that what the character does is bad and other readers are conflicted. So I, I'm interested in placing my protagonists in that, um, in that morally ambiguous space. And I think partly for that reason, I often write in the first person because I'm trying to understand these people with whom I, you know, I fundamentally disagree with some of what they do, but often I'll, I'll give them opinions that I share or feelings that I've felt before. So, um, so that's part of what's going on. And you might think we're, we're praying. And this story is, is part of that. Um, the story deals with echo terrorism and acts of terror are committed regularly throughout the world, but who gets called a terrorist and who's prosecuted for being a terrorist is always political. And as an example of this, um, one that hit close to home some years ago, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I was part of the fight to protect Huichiokan, also called Cherry Point, where there was a massive proposed coal export facility. And Lummi Nation successfully defeated this proposal by asserting their treaty rights. But lots of people in the wider community were engaged in the fight. And some of those people were protesting by chaining themselves to you know, the train tracks, for instance, um, so that the coal trains couldn't come through. And at the time, there was a local state senator who wanted such acts to be declared uh, domestic terrorism. And I just found that so chilling because of course that's happening all over the world where people who are protecting their lands and waters and traditional life ways are often um, targeted by governments. And that is not to justify or condone the protagonist in this story, but just to, to place it in sort of a wider context. 
because he does engage with some acts that people consider eco terrorism and um, I found that interesting. So this first fragment that I'm going to read is from the beginning of the story, and I hope that it helps to set the character up along with a couple of his significant relationships and you know, his, his motivation. I remember last summer, late at night, after some encrypted messages with the group, me and my person took a couple of hits and went outside. It was like one in the morning. and We lay on the roof of my car and looked up at the stars. The sky was so clear, even though paradise was burning and the weather app said smoke was headed our way. My person said they'd been in paradise once and their mind was fucking blown by what they'd seen on social. Photos of hundred foot tall walls of flame. They started crying a little. We don't go in for heteronormative behavior, but usually I am the practical one. Snaking the kitchen sink, coaxing the rat from the attic, procuring weed. I'm the one who has duct taped filters to a box fan so we can effectively clean the wildfire smoke when it comes to our apartment. At least the whole by fire or ice question has been settled. We're deaf going down in flames. But I know when to keep my thoughts to myself. Lying outside in the night with my person, I pointed out what I thought was the Big Dipper. I'm not sure I got it right. When I connected the stars in my mind's eye, I saw something more like a ball of yarn. But my person likes it when I talk about the cosmos, when they rest their head on my shoulder with my arm around them, when I'm gesturing at the sky. Then, the next day, I passed a one-legged homeless woman who was sitting on the sidewalk outside a Starbucks with a little handwritten sign that said, anything helps. I didn't have any cash to give her, but I thought, yeah, yes, right on, anything helps. What my person doesn't get is that Uta and me, we've been trying to do anything. We've been helping. We're not just standing on the sidelines watching paradise burn. With the support of the group, we aim to disrupt destructive supply chains and bureaucratic processes. We are a glitch in the system so that the system will malfunction. This next excerpt, I hope, rounds out the character a little bit. Um, I think it can be hard being a young, idealistic person today, and this character is also kind of hapless. So while he fancies himself an echo terrorist by night, by day, he is a babysitter. If you have to work for money because that's the only way to eat in late stage capitalism, babysitting is not a bad gig. They're two boys, ages eight and 10, young enough to still be real, you know what I mean? I try to teach them about white supremacy and patriarchy-ish because I don't want them to grow up to be assholes and obs. We were assigned white and male at birth, so double whammy. We build forts from driftwood down at the beach. I teach them how to harvest young nettles. We whittle and sometimes we'll build a little fire. The other day, one of them called the other a pussy so we had to put the s'mores away and have a serious talk about genitalia and misogyny. So one thing that I had fun with and also interests me is how um, privilege in a character and in real life can you know, create a kind of moral blindness or a blindness to the world unless and until the blinkers are willfully taken off. So whatever kind of unearned societal privilege, whether it's race, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, gender, all of these um, you know, can, can blinker us to an extent. And I'm interested in what happens and the kind of disasters that can happen when unexamined privilege meets good intentions and, and the collision of those. Um, so the group that the protagonist has referred to before is a big part of his life and in it's an anarchist group that is largely run by middle class and affluent white guys young white guys and so they've got all these progressive ideals but i think they're fairly um they're not wise to their own ways sometimes so this is a little bit about the group and the protagonist who's always unnamed in this because it's first person um, 
he's been in college for a while. He was a music major and then a math major, and now he's, he's just dropped out. One statistics class and I wanted to puke up numbers, and that's when I decided to take a break, get real for a while, because what is public education for? It's for making compliant workers whose meaningless work is never done. Money's the drug that enslaves us to consumerist imaginaries while making us believe that it empowers us. How much do we need to succeed within the system before we can effectively dismantle the system? Post enough of these thoughts on social and you'll soon find yourself invited to the group. This is the group. Cedar, he, him, curly red hair, mid twenties. His garden is full of sunflowers and he and his partner Lark have a baby boy. Or maybe I should just say baby. I am not the boss of his gender or their gender. The OG, she, them, talks a lot about Yon, the feminist collective she used to belong to. When we came up with her group name, for actual truth, it was me that came up with it. She said, I don't get it. So we had to explain original gangster. She said, oh, like I'm old, great. Spruce, he, him, is a poet and a carpenter. Salmon, he, him, works as a wilderness guide. Uta, she, her, is my age-ish, early 20s, total badass. She was like, fuck this fake group name shit. My name is Uta, and that's what all y'all can call me. She hiked the West Coast Trail in like four days and can actually throw a knife like they do in those shows about Vikings where everybody's wearing man buns and eyeliner and tattoos which now that I think about it, if you take out the eyeliner, kind of sounds like cedar and spruce and salmon and me, cool. Uta is an apprentice electrician and she sleeps with more people in a week than I do in a year. I'm not slut shaming here, I'm celebrating her. Although I can't figure out if I'm envious of her promiscuity or jealous of her many lovers. This is a lot of what Uta and I talk about. Do I desire her or want to be her? And this last little bit um, that I'll read is about a minor character, but one that I really like, um, the OG. And she is, I think, an antagonist in this story. And often we think of antagonists as being villainous or obstructionist. Um, but when you're dealing with kind of a problematic protagonist, you know, sometimes the antagonist can be sort of a voice of reason. The OG dropped out of group. We were meeting in an empty parking lot. The virus had people staying at home and away from each other. The OG wanted us all to wear masks, even though we were outside. I don't want to end up on a ventilator, she said, setting a negative tone right away. Most of us were feeling like this was our time to act. The world was quiet so we could be heard. And it's not like the pandemic had shut down the fossil fuel energy grid. It's not like the climate had stopped changing and all the waters now ran clean and animals had been given human rights and governments had fucked off and left the people to run things. No, we still needed to act. The OG was like, guys, you have to think beyond the bumper stickers. You can't just run around shouting slogans and getting arrested. Nobody had actually been arrested at that point. We were just thinking through scenarios. Also, what's wrong with bumper stickers? Also, since when is it okay to call a group of people guys? We figured the OG was full on menopausing, going all crone on us. I got ugly with Cedar kind of mask yelling at the OG. Some days later, Cedar's wife saw the OG, or I can use her real name now that she's gone, Mira. Mira was going into a fricking dollar store to buy plastic crap fresh off a container ship from China. So we don't even know if she was ever for real. Like maybe she was even a mole. And that's all I have for you tonight. But I want to thank you so much for your time and attention. And again, I'm so um, honored to be part of this community. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Julie. I'm seeing a lot of visual applause. And I have to say that your reading must be powerful indeed because I see that my father, Lonnie Sheffield has joined, joined us. Boy, we're almost like 100 people here. 
Dad, listen, I had no idea there were so many four-letter words in that story, honest. And remember, I take care of the poetry stuff. I don't have anything to do with the fiction side. So anyway, um, Julie, that was uh, that was just beautiful. And as I said, so interesting. Um, and I can't wait till people can go. That was such a great introduction, I think. Um, and now people can go and read the, the full story on their own with um, with a little bit of information you've shared with them. I was particularly interested in how you talked about your interest in kind of neutral protagonists, you know, who do things that make us squeam a little bit, like, eh, maybe not me, no. And uh, I, I think that's real interesting territory to explore. Um, okay, well, we have another reader here, and that's C. Marie Furman. C. Marie is the author and poet whose work is rooted in the landscape of the West. She is the author of the collection of poems, Camped Beneath the Dams, Poems, uh, and co-editor, right here, co-editor of a couple of amazing anthologies. This one, um, Native Voices, Indigenous Poetry, Craft, and Conversations is um, a groundbreaking book in the sense that it's the only Native poetry anthology that includes essays on craft as well. So there's a few good ones out there to get. Make sure you get, uh, Joy, Joy Harjo did a great one. Um, and, um, but uh, this this one has the craft talks in it too. And so that uh, really distinguishes it. And um, she, she thought that was pretty good work, but she actually thinks she's actually even more excited about this book. It's not even a book yet. It's so new. It's just this little piece of paper, um, Cascadia Field Guide, that is due to be released on March 1st. Pre-order now, baby. Uh, she has published poetry in... Uh, and or nonfiction forthcoming or has appeared in journals including terrain.org uh-huh emergence platform review northwest review yellow medicine review right here poetry northwest and several other anthologies she's a regular columnist for the inlander translations uh, that's the big um big great newspaper um like publication in the like eastern washington montana big uh, kind of a big range there uh she's the translations editor for broadsided press director and director of the elk river writers workshop she's the associate director of the graduate program in creative writing at western colorado university where um she also directs the poetry program and teaches nature writing um courses western colorado's uh, one of my new favorite uh, programs to learn about they have an mfa in nature writing and they're low residency so what else do you need um she is the current idaho writer in residence and look at this beautiful bookmark they made of her look at that it's my new favorite bookmark so this is all of you idaho residents i think you should apply for the next one because they'll make a bookmark with you too and that's the that's the main reason to do it really um, and she resides in the mountains of West Central Idaho. See, Marie, it's so great to have you here with us. That is likely the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and I would think after spending, I guess, uh, two and a half years with you, we've gotten to know each other pretty well. And and um, and I want to say that if you ever get the chance to spend two and a half years with Derek Sheffield, you should do it. He's a, a fantastic poet and a man that I trust. And that, that says a lot. Um, and it, it means a lot for me to say that too. So I'm honored to have you introduce me, Derek, and, and so honored um, to be here for Terrain. What a what a great, what a great community train is. I like that. I like that we, you know, we can go there for words, but we can go there for this kind of companionship as well. And and um that that also is is wonderful. Um and thank you all for being here. I looked at Laura Pritchett's here. She's the director of the nature writing program there at Western. And I'm seeing so many faces of people I love. Um, 
Pam Ushak is here and Charlie Nightingale, who's one of my students here in McCall and Chandra Brown, which has a wonderful program uh, through FreeFlow. If you get a chance to, to scroll through and look at all the fantastic people that are here and then make a little list and go and look at the work they're doing, you will find that you are in fantastic company, um, which includes Julie and Chris. And this is, this is such an honor to um, be sandwiched between such wonderful writers. Um, and also an honor to come into your home. You know, it's uh, uh, 10 years ago, if you would have said that I would have gone into the home of, of all of these people with my voice, I wouldn't have believed you, not just in my writing, but in my actual voice and presence. And that I'm in your spaces means a, a lot to me. Um, land acknowledgements have become very popular. I myself don't say one, but I, I would like to acknowledge that you're allowing me into your space, which which means a great deal. So thank you for that. Also, hey, tomorrow's Giving Tuesday, as Simmons noted, and um, if you didn't spend all your money yesterday or today and you have a little left over, a contribution to Terrain is really good luck. Great things happen when you contribute to terrain.org. It's um, it's like rubbing, rubbing a lantern or finding 100 pennies um, all with the right face up. So please, please make a donation if you can. So enough of that. Um, I'm going to do something a little different tonight that I haven't done before, and I hope that will be okay with all of you. Rather than read just poems or just prose, I'm going to read from all three genres, um, fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, and thereby kind of create a fourth. And because Train's focus is on the built and natural environments, I, I'm going to extend that to my reading and place it at the base of a tree on the South Fork of the Salmon River, which you can see behind me, which is where I wrote every one of these stories. And I'm gonna build this form around to hold it. Each of these pieces comes from larger narratives or larger collections, um, but because I wrote them in the same place, I feel they belong together. Let it be said that she freely admitted that she was never going to reach the grand master level on the spider solitaire game she played on her computer. Just like she was never gonna get her PhD or be the bride instead of the bridesmaid, she enjoyed the place that she called almost dumb, which you might claim she justified by saying that once you get to the top, there's nowhere else to go. She liked having somewhere else to go. This might also explain the 15 extra pounds she was holding on to at 55, though she did give some credit to menopause and the fact that she stopped coloring her hair and refused the Botox injections, her sister said, might relax the furrow that she developed, not so much from stress, but from looking at the river in bright sunlight. One thing she didn't hold back on was the river. There was no, mar no more miles of it left to walk or left to explore in her kayak. She had seen it from all angles possible, from atop the ridge lines that held it to flying over in a fixed wing Cessna. She knew the South Fork of the Salmon River from its source to where it married the main Salmon River. She'd even snorkeled it so that she might know the river's bottom as well as its banks and silvery, nearly blinding reflection. She knew it in every season, once risking the trail a YouTuber hyperbolically and overpunctuatedly wrote was Idaho's most deadly when it was covered in ice and likely to actually be deadly. She'd been to the river in 107 degrees and she'd walked on it was when it was frozen solid in places saying, Jesus had his sea, but I have the South Fork of the Salmon. On an early July morning, I sit on a ridge against the trunk of an old ponderosa pine. I can see two rivers, the sea sesh, and in the distance, the south fork of the salmon weaves its way through the canyon it is still cutting. The hillsides are green from late winter and from a heavy spring rain. Walking the trail to the get here, the balsam root arrow leaf with their sunflower faces made south facing slopes golden. When the head of a bloom turns just so, the deep center of brown becomes an eye. Then it appears as the whole hillside is arrow leaf eyed, and I am peering into the heart of the Salmon River Mountains. 
The clouds are gathering to the east. A storm is approaching. This ponderosa is older than any of the English names of this place. Its trunk is naked of limbs for the first 20 feet. The three inch thick bark of this ponderosa tree resembles enormous brown puzzle pieces. And the fires that have crept through have merely blackened thin layers, which eventually, naturally, peel off. Science calls the ponderosa fire adapted. Maybe adapted and resilience are more words for survival. This tree was a sapling before there was a state, knew the songs of Nimipu, Tukatika, and thousands of birds. How it survived the ax and the fires when it was younger, I cannot say, but that survival is why I have come. Not far away, near Thunderbolt Peak, the thunder rolls. I have come up here to experience the storm, the wind, the rain. I saw the gray clouds when I woke, remembered the giant ponderosa, and took the steep hike into the air that, as the morning came, grew colder. The breeze has turned to gusts. It goes against better thinking, I know. A ridgeline in a thunderstorm? but there are lessons only the wilderness can offer me. I'm learning about tree sway, about how wind makes the tree stronger because the trunk grows like a muscle as the tree moves back and forth. The very thing that might harm the tree is teaching it how to be resilient. I have lain at the base of pines in the wind and watched the crown's arc across the sky. This ponderosa is a reminder of the great effort living takes, the work of it. It's not only the effort of living, the strength it requires, but resilience that I am learning. Miles below here, where these rivers meet the salmon and snake rivers and then the Columbia, debates continue about the protection of salmon, the release of dams, the safety of wolves, the survival of native women. It would be so much easier, I suppose, to walk into the deep woods, to shelter. But so much that I care about lies on these ridge tops, in presence or in memory, or just below, in, or near these mighty rivers. And like the Ponderosa, I need to know survival in this place and in this way. The rain, when it begins, comes slowly like grace. I push my fingers into the granitic soil and wait. The robin and the hermit thrush are quiet. The fledgling woodpeckers in the hole above me have grown silent too. The wind comes and heaves, tossing the crown of the ponderosa, tangling my hair. Pollen sweeps across these slopes in my bare skins. Despite my fear, I rise to my full height and relax into the gale. When the storm has passed and the trees have stilled, I thank the Ponderosa and walk down the trail toward camp. The sun comes out and my hair and clothes begin to dry. It's then I remember the eyes of the arrow leaf and feel them upon me. I turn once again to look into the heart of these mountains and in the wind that now echoes down another canyon, I hear the words of an elder who said, learn from nature and fight for it. The eyes of your ancestors are upon you. The story was going to be about Tom and Tom, self-proclaimed old white guys who drove into where I was camping to ask about salmon fishing. I was going to tell you how they drove so close I could feel the heat from their car's engine. I was going to tell you that after a brief conversation, Tom said, it's pretty unfair the Indians get a special fishing season. And when I challenged his idea of unfairness, he said, it's not like Indians experience any real racism. I was alone, you'll remember, but not really, because I remembered I was surrounded by relatives. So like the Ponderosa I leaned against, I held my ground. Even when Tom said, it's hard to tell who's Indian. Now, Black people, they're much easier to spot. I was gonna write about another white man I met at an outdoor recreation event. 
he had on a t-shirt that read public landowner. He said, you can almost imagine Indians lived here 800 years ago. I said, we still do. And he said, I mean, historical Indians. I reminded him that in 1855, just 50 years before native homelands also became public lands, native people lived freely here and had for nearly 16,000 years. Public landowner folded his arms. We've been here longer than that. The royal we, I assumed. That latter exchange I shared on social media. I felt threatened by Tom and Tom and erased by the man claiming to protect heritage and not knowing the word's full meaning. So I shared the story because I believe we learn from stories, both telling them and hearing them. And I believe writing is a way of proving and ensuring we do exist. And I didn't want to feel alone, singled out. The response was immense. Native friends gave the written equivalent of a clenched fist raised and savvy non-Native friends offered statements in various head shakes and sighs. But there were objections and they came from a handful of older white writers. One man told me that I was turning off my audience. Another proffered it was time to start telling our stories in new ways, without judgment, with compassion. When I challenged this publicly, he moved the conversation to private. There he began touting respect for me and then vented his frustration about constantly being turned down by native people when he asked for their stories so he could tell them. You see, don't you, how colonialism works? How writers of color are told they must write if they are to be heard? Before Tom and Tom told me how kind I had been and backed their car to my campsite, Tom said, we all just have to start being equal. Sure, Tom. As long as those who have traditionally not had the voice rights privilege position stage get to define equality. The story started out to be a story of two encounters. It was just gonna be about rights, about land, about fairness. The metaphor might've been the myriad ways native people are still being erased by people who uphold a system bent on oppression while professing equality. I wanted to show you who the others are, but perhaps it is more critical for me to show you the ways writers of color are silenced, how we must bend our speech if we are to be heard in the master's court, how we must come with hands full of empathy and education to give those who expect both given to them freely, and then how we hope to hope they accept it. And that's bullshit. Maybe rather than merely knowing our audience, it's time to start challenging them. Maybe a challenged audience needs to sit in discomfort, resist asking for more palatable narratives, and stop defending the ignorance of their ilk. Maybe this way, Native people and all historically underrepresented writers can start telling their stories in a way that empowers the writer themselves. Prophecy. The white man will never be alone. Let him be just and deal kindly with my people, for the dead are not powerless. Chief Seattle. Coyote knows what she is doing. Transmigrating souls of the real people into larch. You must know too, because every autumn, Larch celebrates their abundance with potlatch and give away their summer gold. When you see the bare limbs and spine, you will also see the real people to which Coyote taught that survival comes in shades of brown. Thank you. Oh, see, Marie, that was in Allison Hawthorne Deming's word, gorgeous. Thank you. By the way, <clears throat> you know 
that you can you can actually just take that and use it as a future blurb gorgeous work exclamation mark allison hawthorne deming that's yours you take grab screen grab and go okay um but you can see why um not only that that her work is gorgeous and beautiful um as she is but that she is wise and i have learned so much from C. Marie in the last two and a half years. Oh my gosh, the Zoom hours we've logged. Oh, <laughs> there are hundreds of hours <laughs> and the emails. Ah, but um, yeah, man, that's uh, that's just just gorgeous and and some some uh, richness to take with us um, as we as we go on with the rest of our evening after tonight. I, I had to say this is. Your, your poem at the end there, this is in my yard here. This is the large shed from um, from Friday was the big shed. It's, they're almost like ginkgos in how they all let go like that. Oh man, and the way they are on the snow. Oh, thank you. Whew. Yeah, you're getting a lot of love here. Kim Stafford. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, you can grab all those. Grab that Kim Stafford. Boom. You got you got your blurbs taken care of for your next book. Listen, um, Chris Dombrowski is here, and he is the author of The River You Touch, Making a Life on Moving Water. It's just out. You can still smell the printing press um, from Milkweed Editions. Dad, I'm going to quiz you later. You better be listening because your screen is black. So I don't know if you're listening or not, but I got to tell you, I know that your birthday was in July, but this, but we had to wait for this to come out. So spoiler alert, it's gorgeous. Um, Norman McLean said, holy waters. I wish I had written a book half that beautiful. Uh, I mean, that's what he would have said. He has published um, Body of Water, A Sage, A Seeker, and the World's Most Elusive Fish. That was also with Milkweed Editions. And um, some highly acclaimed volumes of poetry that, and they're, you can see they're highly, um, highly notebooked here, highly uh, sticky noted. <clears throat> um, I got to say, quickly here about the river you touch this book has been getting some notice uh in in the reviews um in review venues and on social media and andy's andy gottlieb's here tonight um one we know a guy who teaches at university of michigan and he's a very smart poet he's kind of got a language poet postmodern bent to him and i'll tell you even that guy who was like, I just read this. It's gorgeous. It's amazing. So even the postmodernists um, love it. And that I think that's saying something. Uh, perhaps, however, I, I do want to say that Alan Braden, Elizabeth Dodd, and Laura Pritchett agree that Chris's best work actually might be his poem that appears in Dear America. Currently, Chris is the assistant director of the creative writing program at the University of Montana, uh, and he lives with his family in Missoula. He is beaming in from there right now. Chris, my brother, it's so good to see you. So great to see you, Derek. And uh, I mean, it's lovely to be here and to see so many wonderful faces out there, people I didn't expect to see, people whose names I hadn't seen in a long time. And um, it's really an honor, honor to be here. Thank you and Simmons and Terrain for putting this on. And um, it's, it's an honor, especially to read with Julie and C. Marie. Um, I'm looking forward to, to tracking down those, those works um, already. I thought um, in particular, C. Marie's, um, someone commented already on the like kind of brilliant seamless hybridity of it. And, um, I taught a course last um, last spring called Hybrid Genres and Other Feral Forms, um, and that work would have fit uh, fit perfectly in there. So 
next um, next spring, 2024, if we're all here, um, that'll be on the course list. Um, I wanted to uh, to read a little bit from this uh, this new book tonight, "The River You Touch." Um, I was rescued uh, a week or so, a week and a half ago, uh, ago by my my dear friend Taylor Borby, who's out in the audience. I, I see, I saw. Maybe he's sticking around, or maybe he was just here to uh, to listen to Julie and see Marie. And then when I popped up, he he decided he would duck out. But um, I was driving home from a reading in um, in Livingston. I had to get home. I've been on the road so much for this book that I just vowed to myself I would um, I would sleep in my own bed um, a couple of Thursdays ago, and so I finished reading at uh, oh eight thirty or so, and had about um, three and a half hours um, to drive home on I ninety. Um, a, a pretty clear, um, a pretty clear, but intermittently icy I-90 and um, and already I was fading at, at like nine o'clock so I called Taylor because if you know Taylor he's the one person who um who to whom you can talk for three entire hours and be entertained the the entire time um I actually nicknamed him during our conversation um I nicknamed him the burning bush because he's he's just so alive and so on fire but um Anyway, we were we were talking a little bit about um, uh, about rescue, um, and so I'm going to read a, a couple of pieces, a couple of sections from the last um, from the last book in this book. Uh, book three here is called "The Nature of Wonder," and it, there's an epigraph that begins the section from David James Duncan. He says, we can seek truth without wonder's assistance, but seek is all we'll do. Um, and I read it especially for two reasons. Um, one, the, the little passage that I'll end with concludes with a, um, um, a father-daughter scene, my daughter Lily and I picking morels. And I wanted to read it to honor um, Derek's work because I think there's no poet in the country who writes so beautifully and honestly and truthfully and, and vulnerably um, about his relationship with his daughters. I just, I'm in constant awe of, of what he's able to do on the page there. So um, yeah, I'll begin with a little um, bit here from a chapter called High Water Rising. Then I'll skip ahead to a chapter called The Dead Stream, which is a, um, another um, kind of a late night talk um, that echoes the one that I had with Taylor. And then I'll end um, with a passage from a chapter called Home Psalm. And the last thing I'll add before I begin is that um, I've been thinking a lot about this, um, this passage that I um, will will end with because um, an old friend once said to me, a book knows more than its writer. Um, the book you're working on, if you're working on one right now, knows more than you do. Um, and this this last little passage kind of revealed itself to me in that, uh, in that sentiment. All right, high water rising. The boat felt shot from a sling. Despite my heaving oar strokes, quaking alders blurred by, kicked loose from the banks by rapidly rising water, in stream particulate ticked against the drift boat's fiberglass hull, holding lies passed by like apparitions, we overtook birds in flight. From the bow seat, aiming well downstream, my friend Jim Harrison made a sharp cast with a weighted streamer, which landed due to our warping speed, even with the port oar. On a straightaway, I looked sternward at our third, Dan, a Montana guide since the 1970s, and shook my head. Without my suggesting it, he had assembled the spare oar and pinned it at the ready under his thigh. Go another bend or two, and I'll spell you, Dan said. He spit a stream of skull over the gunnel. I'd smoke, but the boat's going too fast to light a cigarette. Twenty minutes pa passed before we reached a side channel two river miles downstream from our launch 
and they'd eat out. A bubble line trailed off the grassy island. Finally, some walking pace water, a place to exhale. Harrison, a writer best known for a magnanimous output of prose and poetry that is ripe with an eloquent and ravenous love of earth, teased, teased a parakeet yellow streamer through the soft edge and managed to hook a brown trout. But I regarded the fish, half a yard long and nymph fattened though it was, as a mere distraction. My focus was on the beast that is Rock Creek and runoff. Even in average flows, the water's steep pitch and boulder gardens make for arduous rowing. And during high water events, when dead falls suddenly loose from log jams can form new strainers and render previously cleared channels impassable, the river inaptly named a creek can take a boat in its teeth and refuse to let go. To complicate matters, I'd foregone the safer means of available transportation a self-bailing raft that filters incoming water in and out of its floor in favor of my very sinkable fiberglass drift boat. For all but the least sensible, Rock Creek in June is raft water. I had chosen the drifter though because Jim, at 75 years of age, had grown too unstable to fish from a slippery inflatable. Now, too nervous to peck at the lavish antipasto he had brought for lunch, I came to terms with my having underestimated the severity of the situation, with my having endangered my aging, not so nimble friend. If Jim pitched or the boat swamped, there would be no chance of rescue. Launching had been a bullish call, I concluded, one that was unimpeachably mine. Um, let's see, we make it. Uh, out through what the locals call a heavy place, the microburst, which retains an ominous air. Without missing a stroke, Dan is at the oars now. He slipped us impeccably through two tight S-turns, ran us cork light through a tossy wave train, and sculling masterfully, fought off a couple of grabby hydraulics. From the stern, I watched him scan the hazards ahead of us. Impressively, he stayed several strokes in front of any pending threat. After he'd run the gauntlet, when it came time to swap roles again, I asked him how he'd become such a fine oarsman. I got good quick, he deadpanned, because I never learned to swim. Two hours later, with the takeout in sight, we startled in unison to see the Granite County fire truck, sirens blaring, roaring up the ungraded washboard road. I'll skip ahead to dinner here. Luca, your father tells me that you like to ski, Harrison said in his characteristic nasally growl. Luca is our son, we're at the dinner table here. He rested his ironwood cane on the dining room chair and smoking an American spirit to calm his nerves, positioned himself at the dinner table between father and son. House rules, no smoking. We were making an exception though, as we had just learned through the grapevine that a guided raft floating roughly an hour behind oars, hours on Rock Creek, had flipped on a standing wave and lost one of its passengers to a log jam. Just upstream of the microburst, the experienced oarsman at the helm of that boat had taken the right channel. We'd taken the left. Rescue crews had failed to recover the missing body. When you're skiing down the mountain, Jim continued, boring his erratic, half blind gaze into Luca's. Did you ever see a snow snake? What's a snow snake? The boy responded with an earnest rise. I pushed a cheese plate across the table toward a trio of our mutual friends, a novelist, a sculptor, and the retired chair of the English department. Mary nestled in beside me, Lily on one knee, Malls on the other. In the kitchen, Dan stood over the stove, tending to a roasting leg of lamb. A snow snake, Jim replied, smacking at his cigarette, is a creature that lives under the snow and slithers beneath you while you're skiing. Luca looked up, his eyes saucer wide, wiping cracker crumbs and bits of Spanish cheese from his goatee, Jim drew his face to Luca's. When a snow snake finds you standing still, it pops its head up and wraps itself around your ankle, pulling you under the ground forever. My goodness, Jim, 
said the retired English chair suddenly. She set down her glass of wine. Why on earth would you say such a thing to a boy? The world is a cruel place, he said. He puffed audibly from his cigarette and rarely one to overdo the couth, hacked a grotesque cough. The sooner he knows, the better. A page forward, um, 20 or so pages in this last section of the book to, um, to a character named Ralph, um, who, um, which is a pseudonym for someone um, who, who requested it, um, perhaps because I portrayed him too well. But um, anyway, in this scene, um, I have um, replaced Ralph as, as a, who he was a, um, a beloved instructor at an art school in Michigan. And I've, I've replaced him um, after he retired. And, and he um, he's kind of um, offering me, I guess, um, a little bit of consolation in that I've, I've found myself in a, in a rough place, um, having uprooted the family from Montana and um, found myself in deeper debt than, um, than I was when we were in Montana and um, uh, in a bad way, to say the least, mentally uh, and psychologically. Um, we're we're going to go night fishing. Uh, and so we're taking a drive uh, in the middle of the night in Michigan, up the coast, um, the coast of nowhere as he had it in um, one of his poems. If, as is often the case, you've dug your own crooked channel into the mind's dark matter and found that you can't, despite multiple internal rants and graduate degrees, think your way out of yourself the quickest transport back to the here and now is often a fish or the pursuit thereof. You should know this spot if you expect to survive around here, Ralph said, downshifting, leaning his white Volvo station wagon into a sleeping turn at breakneck speed. Headed north toward the coast, we passed a darkened barber shop, a closed tavern on the outskirts of town, and a credit union whose digital clock read 36 degrees, then 1047, then let us con, then solidate, then your loans. For your sanity, I mean, not for the fishing, he continued. You gotta be crazy to enjoy winter in Northern Michigan. Hell, half of this country, county rather, is probably clinically insane. Ralph's favorite word was crazy. If he liked the person, he called them crazy and made his eyes go all beady smiled an uninhibited smile. If he didn't like a person, he called him crazy, then offered a blank look of utter disinterest. Isn't night fishing crazy, he said. You can't even see the goddamn river bottom. Quills, gossamer in the headlights, a porcupine emerged from a cedar swamp and ambled across the road. Ralph swerved onto the shoulder to avoid hitting the unfazed creature. Crazy porcupine, he said as the gravel rattled against the undercarriage. Occasionally, there were pairs of eyes waist high and mammalian set like jewels at the verge of the trees, but mostly it was just the Volvo's high beams carving out the dark as we meandered toward the lakeshore a road I'd never seen in daylight. Abandoned drive-in movie theater, ice cream stand shuttered for the season, bait shop closed until morning, the dead stream Ralph called it. Do you ever wonder, I asked, why it is that so many writers like to fish? Never, he said, except to say that every real writer and every real fisherman share one trait. He blasted the music and yelled, they're bona fide bat shit. I rolled and I tumbled, I cried the whole night long, crooned aged folk icon turned blues troubadour. I rolled and I tumbled, I cried the whole night long. Woke up this morning, I must have bet my money wrong. Um, we continue on this, um, this long drive through the night um, uh, and end up um, talking a little bit about our mutual friend, Harrison, who was mentioned before. Um, let's see. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm mooning about here. I try not to sound ungrateful, I said, but I assume they hired me to teach poetry, not process paperwork. Why do you think I retired? He said, those people are crazy. They'll latch onto you and suck you dry. I pushed against it every day. Fucking fascist lamprey. An image of the loathed referent, a parasitic freshwater eel that attaches its circular jaws and fang-like teeth to the sides of game fish, leaving the host's flanks dotted with pale scars, flashed in my mind's eye. This is the first regular paycheck I've had since my paper route at age 10, I qualified. I shouldn't be complaining. We have health insurance, for goodness sake. Enough about me. Have you been writing at all? Though he'd authored several acclaimed books, Ralph, per the rumors, claimed to despise writing. I like to have written, he responded. I'm leery of ambition, Junior. You ought to ask that same question of a rock on the shoreline tonight. Ask it if it's been writing. A rock has the proper amount of ambition. He cracked the car window and continued. Half of being a writer is surviving the world. The other half is surviving yourself or selves, as the case too often is. That's what I've been working on. Speaking on, speaking of, you realize our mutual pal Harrison used to live just north of here. Wouldn't you love to stretch out the lines he wrote, all 30 some books worth in 12 point courier, just to see how many miles they covered? The wind was no longer an inland wind. I could smell the coast. What line would you start with? I asked. Easy. We are more than dying flies in a shit house, though we are that too. Our minds buzz like bees, I countered, but not like the bees' minds. My year-old daughter's red robe hangs from the doorknob, shouting, stop, he said. Letters to Yasinin, I said, my favorite from that era. I knew I liked you, Junior. You're no factotum, Newt, he said, rolling down the window to the rubber. So how's the family adjusting to the move? I noted his abrupt subject change, his unerring emotional antenna, a series of letter poems written by Harrison to the Russian poet Sergei Yasinin, who hung himself at age 30. Letters is no Hallmarkian epistolary collection, but rather a sequence of soliloquies that stares down on depression, mental illness, and confronts the sometimes comes to worse consequences of fighting such psychological battles. To broach this book, and potentially my own afflictions, was to go deeper than Ralph wished to on this given night. I'll fast forward a little bit now to this passage that I mentioned uh, that's a father-daughter passage. It's, um, it's from, um, from a chapter called Home Psalm, and the the, um, the chapter that leads into that uh, stars my dear friend Deborah Erling, um, who comes to um, to visit me in this um, in this position where I'm teaching. She comes to give a reading, um, a reading that I thought was going to be from her amazing novel Perma Red, and ended up being um, one of the first readings that I ever heard her give from what was then a book of poetry, The Lost John Journal of Sacagawea and is now a forthcoming novel, an incredible novel that I've just read um, in Galleys, um, which comes out, I think, I believe in the spring. Anyway, um, as she was um, uh, introducing this work on this given evening, after I had introduced her, she said to the students, you know, I bet you're glad to have Chris here. We sure miss him back in Montana. Um, but, but more than that, the land misses him. The land itself misses him. Um, and th those words that she spoke to me were, um, you know, throttling. I sat for 20 minutes, unable to even listen to what she was reading because I had never fathomed, despite the fact that I'd spent 20 years on the oars, that um, my relationship uh, with the landscape could be recognized by the land itself. Uh, and so 
I began to kind of ponder those words um, throughout the rest um, of that of that season. And in that season, I find myself um, picking morels with Lily here. Um, and there's an image here that echoes um, back to Yasinin um, and the rope with which um, Yasinin hung himself. Um, I had no idea when I was writing this image that the image of my daughter's legs around my neck as we were fording um, a channel of the river, our backpack loaded down with morels could be the perfect anti-image to, um, uh, to Yasinin's rope. So I'll close with that. Um, there's a hawk moth in our bathtub, still alive, wings fluttering, leaving a frail coat of iridescent scales on the porcelain when we finally arrive in Missoula, a feast of elk prepared by friends, accompanied by countless bottles and toasts with wild roses floating on wine. On our first Blackfoot float, a bald eagle soaring over the river drops a recently captured brown trout into the water, a freshly dead fish arriving Moments later, downstream at my feet, and hours later, stuffed with onions, potatoes, lemon, and dill atop our hot grill. I want to tell you of these happenings, this week of welcomings. But first, to look for morels with lils. She kneels next to a fallen cottonwood, setting keen, earth-round, earth-reflecting eyes on a drove of morels, a stash viewable only to the prostrate, psst, Dada, she says, I'm finding everything I see. Walking on, inspired by her attentiveness, I turn Lily's words over in my mind as I would a cone. Though I've picked this cottonwood bottom for longer than Luca's been alive and know the aimless drainage well, every encounter here after seems an initial one. My sense is not so much noticing as capturing or being captured by the Earth's inhabitants. I ruminate for a while on my friend Deborah's words about the land having missed me. How could we ever know if the land is communicating with us? Either it's a far-fetched and fanciful idea, or it is rote in that the land is always communicating with us, and we're simply attuned to its frequencies. Plum blossom with slight hints of choke cherry lofting on the June air, I hear you, scent of leeks loosed by our footfalls, wafting up from wet earth, speak my wild name. Tiny white bloom of false solemn and sealed, flaring out from the undergrowth toward your voice, I incline. I'll fast forward just a little to the end of this bit. You can't pick morels again for the first time you can watch a child picking them for the first time. The mushrooms, blonde reflections, blooming in the window wide eyes of the free ones who free the rest of us. By the time the dew is burned off the grass, Lily stands in the trough of a shallow swale, holding a paper sack heavy with her harvest. Wild asparagus, thick as a garden hose, several varieties of mushrooms, scaly hedgehogs, waxy caps, and of course morels, those thumbprints of the gods, bag and toe. She lags a few steps behind me. I stop at the rise to wait, hear a rev shafted flicker call from the canopy. Cheeks flush, she stares into the budding branches, their wide grasp of sky, so that it won't spill when we wade the shallow channel. I zip Lily's cash inside my backpack and lift her to my shoulders. As my sandals shift on the rocks, my trunk wobbles a little, and I feel her knees, thorn scraped and sweaty, tighten pleasantly around my neck. Together, we begin to ford. Thanks. Oh, wow. I'm gonna get some audio applause here. You're getting a lot of visual applause too, my friend. Um, Chris, I just wanna thank you for um, reading those passages, especially the ones featuring Lily and Luca, um, just just beautiful 
a lot of gritty, a lot of gritty wisdom in there. And uh, I see, I see some comments coming in through the chat. Um, it may be that we've exhausted you. Your screen has gone black. Um, if so, we we want to thank you for giving us your, your last ounce. I know that you've been, oh, there you are. I know you've been uh, zooming around the country on a book tour. And I just, we're, we're, we so appreciate you taking some time to meet with us in, in Zoom land here. Uh, and that, my gosh, man, that image of Lily's legs around your neck as the, as the anti-image to the, to the hanging rope is sublime. Thank you. Oh, well, um, any questions, anybody? Or just love uh, comments. Lonnie Sheffield, are you there? Are you probably not probably going to say anything? We still got the burning bush here. I I can see him. I love the lo I love the notion of the land missing you too, um, and it reminded me. Um, well, it reminded me of C. Marie's work, and and and. Um, and also Julie's story too, in a kind of interesting way. Um, gosh, what a what an incredible collection of Earth writers that we we've gotten to hear from tonight. Man, I just feel so full. Um, and it reminded me of uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's incredible essay that she wrote for um, Dear America. And there's this there's this beautiful. Uh, part where she says, you know, even colonists become ancestors. What kind of ancestor do you want to be? You know? And so, so here's Chris, he comes in from Michigan to Montana and has this, this epiphany, thanks to his friend that, uh, that the land could be missing him as much as the people. Where can we get a copy of Dear America? What? Oh yeah. Where can't you get one? By golly. That's the real question huh um thank you thank you for that eva oh Anne haven mcdonald is sending some love you know i think she especially loved all your mushroom passages chris she's a real she loves the fungi oh yeah laura pritchett teaches dear america and so does c marie so they probably have some copies they can send you just, you know, send them an email. No, you can get them. You can get them at, I think Trinity Press might still have a sale going on. Um, check Trinity University Press. Let's see here. Yeah, we got- there, there was, if I may interrupt real quickly, there was a question for C. Marie or of C. Marie's work, which is where can um, some of what you read, if any of it be found? I can answer that. I can answer that. You, it's going to be found in Cascadia Field Guide, baby, right here. So that not poem, all of it, Derek. That poem right there. You hey, can, can pre-order pre now. Can I have a shout out for the Inlander? Look at this. They did their cover. I hate that about this background thing. Hold on. Oh, here we go. The only newspaper I've ever known that is not native-owned that did their entire cover in Salish language and then dedicated the whole paper to um, to the multiple languages we speak. So if you can get a copy of the Inlander, if you're out there, you should get it. And um, and I write a column in there every month or so. And if you go to the inlander.com, you can read the Tom Tom piece, but the rest of it is yet to be published. So thank you all for listening to new work. Nice. Yeah, the Inlander. Big shout out for the Inlander. Inland Northwest, represent. Boom. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, just thanks. Thank you all for these lovely words that are coming in. Um, I do those of you seeking C. Marie's work, more of it's going to be coming out, I know, in, in a book or two imminent. 
but until then too, um, you can, you'll be able to find check soon for some of her poems at terrain.org. And then also emergence magazine, um, is a very fine publication. They're trying to, they tell us they're trying to model themselves after terrain.org, the oldest online literary journal in the world, uh, 70, 25 years and counting, I almost said 75. Um, and, uh, so she, um, C. Marie has a beautiful piece at Emergence um, that you can, uh, Coyote Story, um, that you can check out. Good to see you, Kim Stafford, oh, poet, poet laureate. I, I don't know about you, but I feel safer because Pam Houston has had her, um, she's had her mask on all night and that really helped me relax. Thank you, Pam Houston. <laughs> hey, Lonnie Sheffield. That's my dad, you guys. He's showing himself. All right, look at that beautiful white mane. Hey, Andy Gottlieb's giving you, giving you. Hey, Dad, you can you can say something if you want here. And my uncle Bob. Holy moly! Oh, you're getting the Sheffield boys tonight. Andy Gottlieb. By the way, you have the best. Um, you have the best headphones. There, we took a poll. We did. Hey, any questions for our readers this evening? Lots of love, which we appreciate. But if you have any questions, I think you can, might be able to even ask one out loud if you unmute. <laughs> did I come in late? What time did it start? I thought it started at six. Uh, six specific, six uh, mountain time, five Pacific. Oops, sorry. <laughs> it's I got okay. The time zone confused. We don't we don't keep track of tardies. It's great to see you. <laughs> Thank you Likewise. so much. <laughs> okay, y'all. Uh looks like we're I think we're about there, Simmons, eh? Should we yeah. should we wrap it up? I, th I think we I think we shall. So Derek, thanks for as always being such a wonderful host. Thanks so much to our amazing readers, Julie, C. Marie, and Chris. It's so wonderful to hear your work. Um, I, I think for me, it was the first time hearing all of you read. So thank you for that. It was was stunning. Um, again, we'll have a recording up here in a few days, I think, over on terrain.org. And um, thanks for joining us tonight. And everybody, I hope you have a wonderful evening.